been dealing with a lot of difference and dissent within the United Methodist Church over the last years. How do you hope that uh, the church will navigate that difference and dissent going into our future together? When I think about the difference and dissent in the church, I think the first thing we need to do is have a realistic view and just acknowledge that there is difference and dissent and not emotionalize it. It's a fact. There's difference and there's dissent. Um, we're not going to um, address that by saying, but you can't really think that. The fact is we really do think differently and feel differently and bring our, ex uh, our different experiences uh, to uh, the way we look at the issues that divide us. And we have different estimates of um, how core these particular differences are. Um, the, so just to acknowledge that. And then to say, how do we respond at being most fully ourselves? So as persons of grace, full of grace, moving on a journey where we know we are not static. When I was uh, 20, I didn't believe or think or feel everything that I now feel somewhat later <laughs> in, my, in my journey. Uh, the, uh, and I wouldn't want to. We're not called to build stasis. We have a firm foundation. There's no question of that but we're called to grow. If we see the Wesleyan movement as a movement of growth, then um, the evolution, the, um, uh, the, the um, exposing of different points of view uh, can be absorbed and can be addressed in a different way. So the first thing is reality. And, and to say that no matter our shared roots, the fact is uh, that we have uh, differences about this uh, today. Uh, the second thing that I would hope for as we say, what do we then do, is that we would approach it with kindness, that we would look at each other and see other beloved children of God. We don't necessarily speak the same way. We don't, uh, you know, we may not end up at the same place, but we are beloved children of God, and that's what the Wesleyan theology of grace would tell us, right? That the image of God in you is uh, just as real as the image of God in me, and I should be careful of it. So all of the people that we disagree with and all of the people that we might feel um, uh, are outside the bounds of our community, have that same image of God in them. And in fact, God is not, um, doesn't place the image in you and then walk away, right? God is continually calling. And that's part of what pulls us to this uh, new place is that um, evoking uh, the, the yearning of God for connection with each one of us. So um, realism and kindness would be my first two. And then I would say a realization that delay is not our friend, that organizations don't stay static very well, and that we need to build a pathway towards a future where we can envision God's grace at work. Doing that work of um, looking to the future and saying how we see our identity played out in those pathways um, is uh, part of what I believe will take us to a, um, a way forward uh, that has um, integrity and depth. Because it's not for us a matter nearly of structure. Nine methods are fine about building structures and we can disagree with all kinds of ways and we can see ways to fiddle and improve and no doubt we will. But the question is um, about the vision and about the, what's the poem uh, that, we're, uh, that we're ready to speak to the world and to each other uh, in the way that we uh, move forward. So that's, that's what I yearn for, is uh, hearing that, um, you know, that uh, the far off, um, but, uh, but clear hymn, the old Quaker song, how can I keep from singing? Uh, that far off hymn, 
that calls us forward. That's, that's what I yearn for. And what a wonderful image of um, yearning for the poetry, uh, for, for the church to speak the poetry about its identity and about its vision uh, for the future. Harriet, those are all of my questions. What else uh, that we haven't talked about would you want to share with us? Um, I think, um, you know, as we've gone through this time, I um, have reflected um, uh, some of the, uh, you probably, Kenitha, and some of the viewers will know um, something about Lyle Schaller's work from uh, decades ago. Um, and uh, I remember something that he said to me uh, the, when I was still at the publishing house, which was that if the churches helped families raise their children, they would be growing. Um, and uh, they would be uh, a, lie, a, a force in their communities. And at the time I received it uh, in a pretty mechanical way, you know, but it stuck, my, it stuck in my mind. So I was thinking about, oh, okay, so that's a program, right? Um, he was such a gifted um, uh, person and uh, a gifted observer. Uh, I think what he was really telling us was um, that the church needs to um, engage with the needs of the world, the needs of the members, the needs of the community. And the uh, way that we were, um, and certainly during his long career, the way that we uh, as communities connected to child rearing was quite different. Um, he served through the whole period of time when uh, we went from uh, many women um, uh, predominantly not working outside the home and uh, fewer still working full time outside the home um, to a time when um, the, uh, that uh, totally flipped, right? And the many, uh, many more. Uh, so, and many systems were changing inevitably uh, because of that, including systems within the church. Um, and what, so uh, how were we gonna build the place that addressed the new needs of the communities we serve? And of course, those needs were not uh, new to families who, uh, where the mothers had always worked to help the family survive. Right? That's a, that's part of the, uh, that's part of the dynamic. So, uh, could we have learned from those churches? We could have, uh, but we were not really paying attention that way. Uh, we were busy trying to make those churches more like uh, the suburban churches, and you know, uh, all of that. So how do we um, see the needs of the world and know that God is um, attentive to those needs? God is yearning for those needs to be met. And um, so uh, when we think about uh, the needs of the community, uh, we need to have a really new way of listening. Um, and you may not want to do it in a sociological way, which was uh, Dr. Schaller's view about you know how to do that. But um, some ways of uh, really saying these are uh, needs of the community that we, because of our knowledge of God's grace, and our care for each other, are equipped to address. The poetry will carry us, but that will help to answer the questions of uh, what should we stop doing, but what should we start? What is our call at this time? Um, and how do we um, shape ourselves, our organizations, and our relationships uh, so that we're engaging with our communities in ways uh, that uh, uh, build the strength of the communities in which we're located. So um, I, I yearn for um, a way that the church is, um, uh, that the, uh, the poetry, say, keep saying the poetry, and the uh, liveliness of the church uh, is, um, productive in the world uh, because we carry it with us. Really, to do that, we have to stop thinking about the ordained clergy as being the vessels of that uh, uh, expression of church and saying the life of disciples in the world is what will take us to a new place. Uh, we need to equip the clergy. It's vital. Um, the traditioning is uh, perhaps the uh, uh, has a, its own expression in the life of shaping and calling clergy. But if we think about the uh, group of um, 30,000 or so um, ordained active clergy in the United States as being the mission troop, um, 
we're thinking about the small end of the funnel. The big end of the funnel is the millions of people in church pews and the hundreds of thousands of young people who are saying, where's God calling me? And the, um, the expansiveness of the mission is to have that the song of God, that poetry, that hymnody, that call of grace living in the whole discipled community so that w when we engage in the world, whether in we engage as in a ministry of the church or we engage in our calling as deaconesses or uh, in as home missioners uh, or as individual um, workers in the workplace, we're part of that, um, that mission movement and we're part of that expressing of grace and God's love uh, in effective and um, uh, powerful ways in the needs that we are surrounded with every day. Well, that's a wonderful image of the poetry, uh, a wonderful articulation of the poetry and uh, the whole idea of uh, the very practical expression of grace through mission um, in our own communities, uh, helping families raise their children. Thank you. So thank you, Harriet. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm grateful to be here. Wonderful.